Hey, welcome back to Lawrence McKenna channel, where today we've got a documentary for you made all the way back at the beginning of Jurgen Klopp's raid, the end of that first season, when things were so exciting, so different, we were still building towards and didn't know what was to come in his time at Liverpool. But there were these little seeds, those little moments, those things that we knew were going to make us excited and make us into something that we hadn't felt for quite a while. So there are a lot of big faces in this one. There's a lot of big predictions in this one, but there's also just a lot of interesting stuff that was said. And it was made for a channel that is now defunct on YouTube, is no longer there. And it was made by a friend of mine, Glenn Cowie, and myself for them. And we just want to get it back on the platform and give it a place to live. So this is this is a piece that I really loved back then, and it felt like it was something that was really exciting for me and is still something really exciting for me. I hope you enjoy it as well. If you do enjoy it, get down in the comments. Uh, and if you really enjoy it, then there is, is some more to come. I hope that there is in some way something we can do with uh, this format for YouTube. So this is how Jurgen Klopp made Liverpool believe again. I hope you enjoy it. The final thing to me to do before starting is to introduce the top table. We have the Liverpool chief executive in a and the new manager of Liverpool, Jurgen Klopp. Yeah, the biggest honour I can imagine to be here. For me, one of the biggest clubs in the world. It seems to be I'm a really lucky guy. Eh? So it's, um, it's really a good moment for me. So if somebody wants to help LFC, you have to change from doubter to believer. It's a very important thing. It's a year since Jurgen Klopp was unveiled as Liverpool manager, and what a year. So let's look at what the big German has changed at Anfield. There was huge excitement around the city when he got the job. And not just what he achieved, but the way in which he'd done it, playing such an exciting brand of football. It felt like we'd fallen to a point where Klopp was unattainable. He was out of our, he was out of our reach somehow. To get him in when we weren't at the peak of our powers, it was incredible. It was like going out and shining the best player in the world. And then, of course, he gave his famous I'm the normal one press conference. And everybody was like, OK. He's going to be just fine. So I'm a totally normal guy. Um, I'm the normal one, maybe, if you want this. <laughs> yeah. There hasn't just been one Jurgen Klopp since he's turned up at Liverpool. I think we, you've seen him sort of not grow into the role, but I think begin to understand the role of being Liverpool manager a little bit more and a little bit better. He went from Brendan Rodgers, who was who talked the talk, and you know he walked the walk to some extent, but it all, a lot of it sometimes felt like he had a clear idea of what a Liverpool manager should be and should behave like based on what had happened in the past. Whereas Jurgen Klopp's kind of come in and going, "Yeah, don't worry about any of that. I'm just me." If he makes journalists feel excited then he must make players feel excited. I guess the danger then is that that eventually becomes very wearing, that, that I don't know, it's like Tigger out of Winnie the Pooh or something. He, he would wear you out and maybe, maybe that's what happened towards the end of Dortmund. I think he left Dortmund at a point he felt that he couldn't really do anything anymore. And the club was no longer able to respond to his high pressure uh, kind of management style. And he also hinted at that, that he likes challenges and he also kind of revels in crisis. Virtually everyone was deeply moved and uh, you know it was an incredible departure for someone who will always be part of the um, Borussia family. At first I was surprised how, if I say low-key, he's never low-key, but in comparison to, for instance, the crazy celebrations you'd seen when he was at Germany, when he was at Dortmund and Mainz, there'd not been a great deal of that. I think we're getting to see more and more of that as he's growing more and more comfortable in his skin. I think it's important to understand what that mask is. It doesn't make him dishonest, it doesn't make him hypocritical. It's just that uh, he's, you know, he's like an actor on a stage. It appears that he goes into a press conference with a clear message he wants to deliver. He's worked out the way he wants to deliver that, and he does that, it's a performance. And I think we suspend our disbelief quite easily in the theatre or, or in the cinema. Why not in press conferences? And if that's what it takes to enthuse players and journalists and fans and everybody, so be it. So it's clear that Jürgen has a recognisable style, but what does that require and what is it? I, I was very pleased that early on uh, at Liverpool he, he, he made the point that Gagan pressing is essentially English football of the 80s, made more sophisticated, ramped up in terms of sports science and nutrition and fitness. Gagan pressing or counter pressing is immediately attempting to win the ball back as soon as possession is lost. This is done by creating overloads in the area of the pitch where you're attacking. A number of managers, Guardiola, Bielsa, Klopp, have realised that the moment at which a player is most vulnerable is immediately after he's won the ball. So you make a tackle, you may be a little bit off balance, you've just expended energy in making the tackle, uh, you perhaps don't quite have a clear vision of where other players are on the pitch, your, your own players and, and the opposition players. 
So if you are hounded suddenly by three or four players, it's very difficult for you to, to find the right option. This requires a narrow and compact shape to press aggressively and press successfully. He shifted from a 4-2-3-1, which is what Brendan Rodgers was playing, to a 4-3-3. He's dropped two midfielders, two attacking midfielders into central midfield with Adam Alana and Jeannie Wijnaldum. They've got engines, massive engines that they can get around the pitch, but they understand where everybody's supposed to be on the pitch. To do it well requires great organisation because the danger of three or four players charging at one player is if you, if you break that press, you've left space in behind you. It also requires enormous fitness. And I think that's the difference between Gagan pressing and the pressing you saw in the 80s when Liverpool were doing it to win European Cups. It's done with far greater intensity for far longer now, just because players are fitter. If the press isn't successful, the team will then drop back into their defensive shape and look to force their opponents into pressing traps, or an area of the pitch where, again, the team looking to win the ball back has numerical superiority. Even as fit as players are today, they can't actually run 100% for 90 minutes. So you have to work out when it's appropriate to do it and to which players it's appropriate to do it. Right now, and I, I don't think anyone would have said this a year ago, but Adam Lallana is and has been an absolute revelation since Klopp came in. He had a, a track record for being a burn brightly but burn shortly kind of kind of footballer. Last season, he, he upped his work rate, he upped his fitness, and he was the kind of guy who was given 90 minutes of uh, absolute tireless performance. I would also kind of caveat that with the fact that it hasn't worked for all of them. Daniel Sturridge, for me, seems to really be suffocated by that structure. He doesn't seem to thrive in the same way that his teammates do. I, I think Klopp sees in Sturridge a very skillful player, a great finisher, and sees somebody he maybe could work with, but Sturridge has got to adapt himself. Firmino leads and characterises the attack. He's, he's economic when he gets the ball. There's not flourishes really. There's a few lovely turns, but they, you know, they feel as though they've got a purpose. It's not, he doesn't hold onto the ball too long. And obviously he's, his movement's terrific both on and off the ball. The progress that he's achieved hasn't been with a blank checkbook. You know, he's actually returned the profit in terms of the dealings that he's done. We just love tireless workers. We love people who go out there and bleed for the cause. Everyone in the team puts their count levels of effort into everything they do. It's like blindingly obvious. It's like an answer's been in front of you along where you say something that's just, it's ridiculous, it shouldn't need saying. If that was all we had, I think we'd be happy. But the beauty is, is that with, with the, the level of ingenuity that Klopp brings, that level of work ethic is a platform for success. And it's that style and commitment that have afforded Liverpool some of the most enjoyable moments of their recent history. You can start to pull little bits from little games now over the past year and go, all right, we'll take that from the Manchester City game, we'll take that from the Villarreal game, and we'll, we're going to add this now, and that's what you saw against Hull. It was a victory against a team that wasn't looking to come out and play. You watch those those opening 10, 15 minutes, and every time Curtis Davis or Mohamed El Mohamedi gets onto the ball, they've got no time, they've got no passing lane, and turning it over so high, it just opened new avenues for Liverpool, and... They really had that game won within the first 30 minutes. People look back at Chelsea and it felt at the time, you know, it's the most animated I've seen the manager on the touchline with reference to things like, not just goals, but with things like, you know, refereeing decisions, decisions his, his players are making, wanting to see the game out and maybe a bit of a shift from the process stuff I've talked about towards, we've got 2-1 here, we get over the line. Well, I mean, the, the game against Dortmund was the... You know, those are the nights Anfield lives for. Those are the nights that, as a journalist, you love being at Anfield for. Tell your kids, tell your grandkids, kind of, kind of performances that we put on the pitch that night. The greatest European night that's been at Anfield. I mean, I think because Liverpool didn't go on and win the Europa League, some people will say, well, no, it, it can't be judged as that retrospectively because there wasn't a trophy at the end of it. But purely on the basis of that night, I mean, that last half an hour was just extraordinary. That very strange sense of inevitability uh, that you can't really explain. But that Dortmund game, once the comeback began to happen, it was, okay, this is happening. You know, I, I'm confident that Liverpool will win this game. And you know, an hour after the final whistle, you're writing your report thinking, this is weird, why, why was I so confident? Why did, and if I feel it in the press box, fans must feel it, players must feel it, and then it sort of becomes self-perpetuating, self-fulfilling. So the fact Klopp has the capacity to instill that in players, I think, is hugely encouraging. But then the Europa League final showed perhaps limitations. I mean, they were 
they were utterly outplayed by Sevilla in the second half. No system and no manager is perfect. He, again, it's back to this idea that he believes in process, that if the players play well, they'll sort this out for themselves. And I think that at times that's not necessarily what you want from a football team. Sometimes they maybe need a little bit more help than that, but he sees himself as, as, as gathering them on a journey, not as trying to get them through every little stage, but instead this idea that if you just, I want you to develop all the good habits you can. They see the football that they get their sides to play as process, as you just keep doing the right thing. I don't think anybody's actually said this on the record, but I've certainly know one coach who definitely is in that pantheon, who's very, very sceptical about him, who sees him as a motivator and nothing more. And I think within coaching circles, there is a certain scepticism about him, that they feel he's maybe not quite precise enough. Clearly motivation is a huge part of what he does. But I think there is a sense, and I'm not saying I agree with it, but I think there is a sense that he's not quite as sophisticated as a Guardiola, as a Mourinho. You know what, if there's things that he's doing wrong, I, for the first time in years as a Liverpool fan, I'm able to do this. Which, which coach in the world has beaten Guardiola the most often? Jurgen Klopp. Uh, he's beaten him four times, and Mourinho's beaten him three times, and Mourinho in far more games. So, he's got something. I, I thought it was really obvious last season when you saw United play Liverpool, that Van Hal's football felt old-fashioned. It felt like this was something from, from the 90s, or maybe a little bit after that. Whereas Klopp's football felt very new, very, very vigorous, very percussive. I think there can at times be a sense with Guardiola that his football is a little bit bloodless, a little bit too cerebral. Whereas Klopp's is very much football of the heart. So how's this guy fitted in at Liverpool? I think Jurgen Klopp knew a lot about Liverpool football club before he joined Liverpool. Fans, you know, have, have taken him to their hearts so quickly because he comes across like like somebody who who understands the way in which cities like Liverpool work. And again, a lot of these feelers are the nebulous concepts, but they're not. Anfield was very quiet for matches. Um, you know, famously in, in Klopp's early days, he bemoaned people leaving early. It's partially from the past. It's partially from a German tradition of linking supporters and uh, players in a way which is sort of at times lost in English football last season. They do the, the Germanic go to the crowd at the end of the line up after a 2-2 against West Brom and it causes a fair bit of controversy because it was only a 2-2. People around the country look down on him for it. Oh, it's only a draw against West Brom and and all that. So what? When you're in the stands and you pay good money to go and see your football team, you want them to show you respect because they understand then how much it means to you. I think you've seen it this season, but what he's learned from that or decided to do differently from that is now, Klopp and, Klopp and his players come together straight after the game and they go as one to the supporters. They're not lined up and holding hands, but it feels like it's Klopp and Henderson leading these lads over to say to the supporters, thank you very much for your efforts. But it feels like it's something he's wanted to make clear to the players and he's wanted the supporters to pick up. You know, if, if I get these lads to give everything until they've got not an ounce of energy left in the bodies, on the one hand, will you hang on as they demonstrate that they will fight with every ounce of their energy in their body and their being, will you do that for us? So I think you've got to, you know, you can you, you can get lost in this nostalgia, but I think it's important, the idea that you get to see a Liverpool manager who, who just loves the crowd, who loves the pageantry, who loves the songs, who loves who wants the noise, and I think he's definitely one who wants that. There will naturally be comparisons drawn because he's a larger-than-life character and Liverpool Football Club demands that the manager not just be a man who you know, is on the training ground or he's a guy who puts the team out or, or whatever. You, you, you've got to be a sort of pseudo-spiritual leader. It's absolutely true that Liverpool feel they need a messiah. At all times, they need a messiah. They, they want you know, somebody else to be, to be Shankly. In Jurgen Klopp, I think Liverpool identified that this is a man who kind of will resonate with the the tradition of the club. You know, and I think he's been very clever in the way that he is he's he's created that bond with the fans. Now you're seeing Liverpool fans going in optimistic every game, wanting to sing the heart out. And this is a man that you know he hasn't even brought any trophies to the club yet. So you think, you know, what kind of status is he gonna enjoy when that happens? And so that all leads us to ask, what is the future for Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp? He, he turns players into world-class stars and you know, we're, we're seeing the, the signs of that already at Liverpool. How much money do they have? Who, who can they, will they bring in? Will the very top players be prepared to play that kind of football? There's no one who scares me in the division. The only thing that, that concerns you is if Liverpool can keep going at that pace and that's not my job, that's Jurgen Klopp's. And what's, what's extraordinary, um, and, and I think a good thing, is that his record in terms of points per game is still lower than Brendan Rodgers'. And yet, there's so much more positivity, so much more sense that Liverpool are moving in the right direction. Since Klopp took over, they've created more chances, thus had more shots on goal, and obviously scored more goals, which is massive 
If you want to go and win the Premier League, you've got to score your goals. In the defensive sense, they've massively improved with the introduction as, of Jordan Henderson as a number six. But also in terms of turnovers in the opposition half, Liverpool are number one. They've won more tackles than any other side in the Premier League since Klopp took over at Anfield. I mean, it's partly just, I think that is the case, but partly his charisma has allowed him to uh, sort of brush off the poor results. So much am I enjoying the brand of football that we're playing that I'm just, I'm just looking forward to five years of that. I've, I'd now feel disappointed if Liverpool didn't finish top four this season. I think that they've given themselves a terrific base. That's not to say it'll be easy, but simultaneously, if you offer me a guaranteed fourth place finish right now, I'd say no. I'd say I want to see, you know, I'd rather gamble and look to see how high up the table Liverpool can finish up to including top this season. Uh, look, I'd like to hope that we can do it. I definitely think we can challenge. I think we've got the right man for the right club at the right time, and that's what it's about, really. There you go. So as we enter the sunset of Jurgen Klopp's career, I hope that you guys enjoyed the documentary. You saw the kind of seeds that were sown at the start of this, some of the big predictions, some of the big faces. We've actually got some other documentaries, again, from that channel, uh, but I kind of wanted to make some more. And I, I just, at the end of this, wanted to pick your brains. First of all, do you think that is still something that people would be interested in on YouTube? I know there are a lot of people making documentaries, um, but you know, is this something you guys would be interested in? If you are particularly interested and you want to support stuff like this, then first of all, there is a Patreon that is in the link in the description. You can go and support the work that we're going to be doing down there. There is also a director's commentary, which will be coming out later this week on my Liverpool channel, which is a little bit about how we put the documentary together, but also a lot about some of the predictions, some of the analysis that we had in the documentary that went on to be true and kind of just breaks down some of the thoughts and uh, kind of just says, hey, look, we were pointing this out back then and unpacks it a little bit more. So I hope you guys are interested in that. That's, that's a little bit longer and obviously is a little bit more uh, of my analysis on top of the amazing faces that took part in this. So um, first of all, thanks to all those people. Uh, thank you to, for you to you guys for watching. And if you are interested in this, if you do think there is, I don't know, legs in a little bit more, then let me know in the comments below and we will upload some more. I think we made another one about Pochettino and another one about Conte. You know, Conte is not in work right now, but Poch definitely is. And there are some amazing stories, some amazing people in them. So, you know, I, yeah, uh, if you guys are interested, let me know. And uh, if you've not already hit subscribe, well, what are you doing? Like, you've stuck around to this point. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I'm really grateful to everyone who is in this community. Uh, hopefully we're building towards something because, I don't know, I, you know, it feels fresh. And even though there's an old documentary at this point, it's still something I really love and you can, you can see the passion in my eyes and the passion in everyone else's eyes. YouTube was maybe a slightly different space back then, but yeah, this is enjoyable. So hope you guys enjoyed. Welcome to the channel. See you guys later. Yeah, thanks for watching.